Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our talk today, Infusing Wellness. I look forward to the next couple of hours with you, I guess, hour and a half with you and to teach on a very, very dear subject to me. So welcome. The first part is usually like a land acknowledgement. Um, so it takes a little bit. So if you wanted to grab so a snack or your cup of coffee, not coffee or tea at this hour, feel free to do so because um, we'll start um, shortly. My colleague Disha will be here. She's in the chat. Um, she'll also help with some tech support as needed throughout. Um, if you want to say hi, Disha. And um, we have heavy topics that we're going to chat about. So I encourage you to ask questions, raise your hands, and really promoting and encouraging a welcome and warm environment today for our workshop. If you miss any parts of the workshop, it will be available online afterwards. As you can tell, we're recording, but um, we also try really hard to take out anyone who shares anything in the recording. So um, their confidentiality will be preserved in that manner. Close all my windows. Okay. So let's get started. I am honored to speak to you today from the traditional territories of Scugog Island First Nation. And I'm honored to be a visitor on this land my entire life. This land brings me peace and solace, as well as a comfort to be in this space. Even though we have these very temperatures, every part, every season that we encounter is very beautiful. And I'm honored to have the opportunity to be in this space. I also wanted to acknowledge before we start that we live in a land that is embedded in racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of discrimination. So I speak from my experience of those things, but I also speak from the stories that I hear from others. I've been honored to hear. Today, as I would share with you, you know, really how racism influences our wellness, you'll hear that a lot um, in our conversation today as well as how it influences our healing and our roles in parenting. And uh, this quote here has been taken from Dr. Kua Benjamin, who is a Canadian scholar who coined the term anti-Black racism in 2003. We're also um, funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. It is one of our first funders that we've received since 2019. And before then, my workshops were offered at a cost. And so being able to provide these workshops, I think we've done over 40, maybe more, um, featuring many speakers and many small businesses. And so we're really grateful for the opportunity to do this work. If you are, or you know anyone who is a speaker or presenter who would like to present for us, um, we welcome, we welcome their um, their ability to do that for us. So feel free to send a referral or just let them know about who we are, Kitanga. Today, I'm hoping to cover these topics as identified here on my slide. We have about an hour and I have really condensed multiple lectures that I've done into one. I am gonna repeat some videos that I've done before. So if you've seen it and you're like, oh, I don't wanna see it again, you know, feel free to um, take a break during those times or anytime you need to, but um, just so you know. And I encourage and welcome questions. So if you have any questions, please ask. 
please use the chat, raise your hand if you need to. Um, this space is really for you. We're teaching this course for you. And so I hope that as I'm teaching, I'm also inspiring you um, and clarify any questions that you may have because I will um, probably go through the, the content very quickly. So my apologies for that. And at the end of the workshop, so every workshop we have goals, right? So at the end of this workshop, I'm really hoping that you can understand how our experiences are so impacted by our lives today. But we very much can control how we react and how we choose to live. And so I hope that you know, um, however you come into the space today, that you are supported and really can achieve the wellness that you know. I hope that you are reminded today that healing is a journey. It's really lifelong. And the moment that you transition you know, out of this world, um, that's when the journey ends. So I want and encourage you to see healing in that way. Also wanted to take some time just to see who's in the room. So I'm going to pull up a quick poll if I can find where the polls are. This is just quick to find out who's in the room, who's a parent, who's not a parent, um, and who's a caregiver, who's got grown children, and who's like, I don't wanna be around children, but I wanna know about wellness. So I invite you to complete this brief check-in with me. Okay, great. Um, can you see the results? Okay, good. So um, there are some people who here work with children. Great, welcome. Um, many people are a parent, caregiver, guardian, and then they may also have grown children. I have a grown child too. And some are grandparents. Hello, grandparents. I'm so glad you came to join us today. So thank you. This is like my most favorite quote in the world. Um, and I thought I would start off our talk today. Last week, um, my colleagues and I had the opportunity to host a conference called the Resto Reform. And it was really a conference that brought together people, policymakers, leaders, and influencers, you know, who wanted to develop change within organizations and institutions. So um, I wanted to really start this conversation with these words, I see you, I hear you, and I understand. You know, I know as parents or caregivers, sometimes we take on this role with pleasure, with choice, um, but we also sometimes take on this role because we need to survive. We love our people, our littles, you know, our toddlers, our grown adults, even our parents. Sometimes some of us are caring for our parents, right? We're de dedicated to their humanity, we're dedicated to their right to have a good life. And we're really, you know, focusing on and wanting a really potential future for our families. But sometimes in doing so, we neglect our needs. We move on from our loss. We take insults and backlash. We figure out how to pivot. Remember when, when difficult things happen and we develop a strength that we say only God can give us. And we learn crafty ways to say yes, because saying no is very hard. Um, and I grew up as this woman. I grew up with this woman. She was my mom. I grew up with my auntie and my best friend, who are also very much like this. And I wanted to acknowledge that I know that you hold and that you do a lot. And I know that um, you'll always be there for, for your children, for your grandchildren, um, and for future generations. For the next hour, the time that we're together, I want you to really consider, I invite you to consider, what do you need to do for you? 
if you put aside the dance of life, you put aside the need for survival, the hustle culture that we've been so grown up to love, and just focus on what does it look like or what could it look like to live a life that's worth living. And so I leave you with this quote as we start our conversation today from Audre Lorde, who says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that in itself is an act of political warfare. And if something comes up for you um, in our conversations, you know, feel free to share your thoughts or your opinions, or if you hate the quote, feel free to also share that as well. So welcome. So I wanted to start off with myself, I guess. Um, so I'm a mom, as I shared before. I'm an auntie, a sister, um, cousin, a friend, and a lot of these experiences, a lot of these roles, they explain parts of me, but they don't explain the whole of me. They have 100% the roles that I play influence my thoughts, my feelings, and my experiences. You know, I started parenting when I was about 23, and I was really determined to be a different parent. But I didn't know what that entailed. I didn't know what I was supposed to do or how I was supposed to do it. Um, and really today, I'm just here to tell the story from my experiences, and I'm hoping that something resonates with you. The one thing that resonated with me when I was writing um, or preparing for the talk today, I was thinking about parenting and, and oftentimes, you know, as parents, we hear messages about ourselves explicitly and implicitly that we're not good enough, that we're not worthy, that we're not valued and not important enough to be seen. And it, that experiences really creates like this lasting mark on us. And when I, as a psychotherapist and I'm talking to parents, a lot of them, you know, hold on to guilt or hold on to shame and hold on to things that they felt that they could control, but um, it has really impacted how they show up as parents. As a parent, I learned that this is a message that I had to convey to my daughter and also for the children that I was privileged to care for throughout my, my life, I had to teach them that they were more than just that, that they were enough, that they were worthy, they were worthy. And I also had to fake it because even so sometimes I may not have believed that I was worthy or believed that I was a good parent, or if I held a lot of guilt in my parenting, I had to believe it enough to show it to them so that they wouldn't feel the, those feelings. Um, so I wanted to start off with this activity with everyone in terms of that affirmation. So in your journals, in your cell phones or wherever, write down five affirmations that you have for yourself. And I've written down, I stole this actually, borrowed it, um, of like affirmations um, that I found online. But anything that resonates with you or if you... Um, you have other things that you tell yourself about yourself, whether you believe it or not, write those down. And then choose any of those affirmations and share it in the chat. So I'll share mine with you. Oh, I love that. Thank you. And any other affirmations that come up for you? And we'll start our journey today talking about the weeds, but we will ground ourselves in um, our affirmations. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
Keep them coming. So let me fully introduce myself. My name is Nicole. I am a first daughter. That's always important. Um, I am a Gemini, those two sides. And my parents came to Canada. I want to say my dad came around 1973. My mom came to Canada in 1975 and I was born after. And as you see here, I'm pictured with my sisters um, who are younger than me. Um, my dad's story is he came to Canada, he was lonely, he needed a wife, so he had known my mom, they live in the same valley, so he knew my mom, and his mom talked to my grandmother, and they got married. My mom, she was like, I need to get out of the valley, because they lived in the valley, and um, so she was like, yes, I'll do it, and it was a perfect match. Um, obviously it was not, there's lots of like ups and downs and challenges. And so I will share with you some of the challenges, you know, when having parents who didn't know each other, didn't have, you know, those values, um, in sync and how it impacted, you know, the life that we experienced. I also wanted to preface and share that even though my parents were newcomers into the country, you know, they still were not kind of the typical picture of Black families that I was exposed to on the media or growing up. You know, my, my parents had their first home in like 1970-ish. They purchased new homes. They were professionals. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, and we were very much surrounded by um, other Black professionals who were well off in our community. And so that is kind of the perspective that I come from. I share this because I wanted to be respectful because there's times where people go through challenges around poverty and and um, difficulties. And I wanted to preface that, that that is not kind of my experience. You know, I'm, I live like that, right? I travel right now a lot. I eat well. You know, I, I get a ride to Toronto when I don't feel like driving. Um, and so my life and experiences are different. But what kind of brings us together is that experiences of racism, experiences of being a newcomer and the challenges um, that we encountered. And that's kind of where I'm landing our conversation today. These are all very important topics to me. And, you know, in the 40-ish years of life that I've been here, I've really lived and I've lived literally walked with my clients, walked with my family and friends of, as they've gone through these experiences. And I wanna talk first about shame. Does anyone know about shame? Often my clients, when you know we start talking about their experiences, talking about shame is something very difficult for them and they don't ever wanna start there. But I do, because I know that growing up as a black woman in a very white Canada, you know, shame was often replicated in all areas of my life until I actually believed and felt that shame all the time. And then when you come from a family who are, you know, parts of generations of enslaved people, shame was so much embedded within the culture of our identity that it, um, it kept us back. It's what causes, you know, what my colleagues would often say, imposter syndrome. Shame kind of drives addictions and mental health. It also really disrupts families and relationships. So shame is our starting point, but I'm hoping that we can also spend some time talking about grief and loss, spend some time talking about relationships, and finally kind of close on the lens of trauma and particularly intergenerational trauma and racial trauma. So how does shame fit in? I usually use this definition of shame that I borrowed from Brene Brown, who says that shame is that intense, painful feeling or experience that you believe that you're just flawed and that you're not worthy of being loved and you're not worthy of belonging. And we're not just speaking about shame that comes from myself as an individual, as I shared, 
It's also shame that's felt on a communal level. So that happens within your family, that feeling that family shame. It happens with how our identity interacts with different systems. And shame is so connected in history. And so it's passed down to our generations and it's reinforced in relationships. I quote this author who, um, she also works as a social worker and she wrote in her book um, based on a black client that she was speaking with. And the client told her, you know, shame told me there is something fundamentally wrong with me and those who look like me. Society said so, and I accepted that I was inferior. I was the other, I was a mistake. And life then became a task to do rather than a journey to enjoy. I'm gonna repeat that. Life then became a task to do rather than a journey to enjoy. And I had bought into the lie. According to the same author, you know, she talks about shame is that reinforces that we're flawed and it has nothing to do with who we are as people. It has nothing to do with our journeys and what we've been through. It has more to do with what we've been told throughout our life experiences and how when things happen, it gets replicated, that feeling that we're not good enough. So shame creates this narrative in our heads that, you know, we're not good at work when we receive constructive feedback. Or it's rooted in our relationships when we're having an argument with our partner and our partner walks away from that argument. We start to feel shame. Shame is a, a part of the narrative when a police officer brings our young child home because they did something they weren't supposed to. And shame creates these limited beliefs that keeps us from taking risks, trying new things, from living through our potential. So life is that task as opposed to a journey that we're supposed to enjoy. And it starts from the very beginning. So I often share the story of my nephew. And when my nephew entered into kindergarten, he's four years old and he is this outspoken, like social, very intelligent young man. And he's in the second year of junior kindergarten. No, first year of kindergarten, sorry. And four years old, he's already been to, to like nursery school daycare. So he's kind of gone through the, the routines and um, he comes home and he says he got into trouble or his teacher called and said he got in trouble for hitting his peer. And the teacher decided because he got in trouble that she was gonna place him in the corner and told him to think about what he did um, and not being a good friend. So my nephew, when he got home, he explained that what had happened was his friend was hitting him and he was responding to his friend in a playful manner. But as a result, the teacher only saw him responding in that manner, he was isolated, and that he interpreted that entire situation that he was bad. And that sense of badness, not being good enough, is reinforced to our children throughout their lives and it becomes intensified and which is why I talk about shame so much. So imagine here you are growing up in Canadian schools, whether it's in Scarborough or in Oshawa, and those experience happen, whether you're the center of the teacher's um, discipline or your teacher doesn't even pay attention to you. Those feelings of shame is, is planted as you grow up and as you get older. So shame comes up when we don't feel and we can't live up to the messages that are said about us. And so I brought this quote here as a way of kind of landing our conversation on shame and bringing back to the piece around parenting. And sometimes we feel that we're not good enough or that we are guilty for the things that we may have done um, throughout our child's experiences and even as they're adults. So holding that pain does it mean I am not strong? Showing sadness and hurt as a parent doesn't mean that I'm not strong. It's not living up to standards. Um, that's what fuels the shame. So because of that, as a mom, I don't always ask for help. 
And I can't tell you that I've messed up and I can't be vulnerable because if I do, it reveals that shame that I'm feeling. And the quote here, you know, is salient in that, right? That term that we're supposed to accept the experiences that we have, not do anything about it, not say anything about it. And it just becomes internalized into who we are as people. And if this is resonating with you, I invite you to, to share your thoughts in the chat. And Disha, if you have any comments or questions about this uh, this topic, feel free to uh, to share as well. So there's a unique link between anti-Blackness and white supremacy and shame. And so Kenneth Hardy, which I'll play a little bit of his um, video, he talks about the impact of racial oppression and he defines it as that traumatic form of interpersonal violence, which lacerates the spirit, scars the soul, and puncture the, the psyche. And he describes ways in which oppression can impact individuals. I landed as a parent, right? That feeling of shame, those experiences can impact how you show up as a parent, how you show up for your child, how you show up in your relationships with your partner, how you show up in your relationships with your family. Dr. Hardy, you know, identified how racial impression impacts us. And the first one he talked about was internalized evaluation, which is linked to the idea that whiteness is better. Everything that is non-white is not good. And so growing up as a professional family, as I shared before, being close to whiteness was valued. It was how we dressed, how we spoke, how we conducted ourselves. And it felt that if we did act like white people, that we would be accepted. This in itself is the nature of white supremacy. I'm not talking about the KKK. I'm talking about the idea that we striving to be white and that whiteness is elevated, it devalues being black, it devalues being brown, it devalues having a different ability, devalues your sexual or your gender identity. And so you're left with that assaulted sense of self where you're constantly feeling that you're not good enough and you're experiencing narratives that define your identity that isn't actually who you are as a person. And then that feeling of voicelessness. So then you can't talk about those experiences that you have and you can't bring up the hurts that you feel because you don't have a voice. You're taught that your voice doesn't matter. Wanted to share with you a quick video um, from Dr. Hardy where he kind of explains what that means in, in our experience. And so the therapist in me who sits with Black families, I'm always struck by the fact that white, white parents talk in very glowing terms about what their children are and what their stellar accomplishments are. And Black families feel compelled to talk about what our children are not. My son is not a bad kid. He's not in gangs. My son doesn't wear those baggy pants. This need to sort of address the ways in which our children are perpetually defined. So this assault of sense of self is painful, enduring. It can be managed, but I'm not so sure it could be healed. I mean, if you were to imagine that for some odd reason, odd and very inexplicable reason, that each of us today came in here with a hammer and a nail 
And we felt compelled to nail, to hammer the nail in the wall around Peter. And then it was pointed out to us how much damage was done to the wall by all these nails. And then we quickly regrouped. We went back and we moved the nails from the wall. What remains are all the holes from the nails. That's what the assault had sent the stuff was like for Black people. There's a way in which it is buttressed by a lifelong exposure to devaluation which is what happens when one is stripped of one's dignity, where respect is denied. There's also this untold story around voicelessness and the ways in which in our life that the voices of people of color are often silenced. I find with people of color that it's hard for us in settings like this to even say white, to name whiteness. We resort to code language like other people, some people, members of the dominant group, and we don't name it. And I understand why we don't name it, because we have a protracted history of really awful things happening when white people get uncomfortable. Um, these new features of Zoom are throwing me off. So how do you heal shame? Anyone have any ideas? Oh, I don't want to go there. Anyone have any ideas of how do you, sh how do you heal shame? And I see your question. Thank you. Can you talk now? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank Good you evening. Sorry. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we could heal shame by just acknowledging what is happening because I think what we need to understand, our story is no different than the next person's story. Yeah. Um, it's a repeated pattern, and I think that people need to understand that it's expected for us to make mistakes. Yeah. and um, acknowledge it and um, try our best to move forward. I agree. Thank you so much. It's very beautifully said. Anyone else have any thoughts? How do you heal shame? I'll give you some ideas and feel free to continue using the chat, of course. Um, Dr. Hardy in the same article, and I totally forgot, Disha, if you can find the article, we can share it in the group if that's possible. Um, I can also send an email after and share the article. This article, again, was written by Ken Hardy, and it's called Healing the Wounds of Race Trauma. But he talks about, you know, how do you heal racial trauma or how do you heal these experiences of shame? And for me, it's it's very similar. You do the very opposite, right? You don't shame, you uphold, you reinforce that people are worthy and um, 
are very much worthy of, of belonging and being part. And even though, as we said, like we make mistakes affirming that it's okay, that failure is okay. And so he goes through the steps around affirming and acknowledgement, which means let's talk about it, creating space to have these conversations so that we're not silenced. Rachel's storytelling, how many of us, you know, learned about who we are through those stories that we heard growing up um, or stories of our family, as I shared, even my own family, those experiences give that, give us that sense of like pride and joy um, being able to validate and name our experiences, being able to externalize, so not internalizing the negative messages that we see or that we hear, um, counteract the devaluation that happens. So be really intentional in terms of noticing when you're hearing negative things or you're telling yourself ne negative things about yourself, that you're constantly counteracting that positive affirmations or other ways of like balancing out those thoughts and rechanneling rage, which is really important because those experiences often also make us feel really angry and upset. So this is my next activity for you. I wanted to share with you what brings me joy. So if you can also share in the chat, what brings you joy um, and share with others because it helps um, to build in that greatness. So that's why I shared me and my daughter at Caravana, um, at Carnival, that's something that makes me happy is being in that space, listening to the music and, and being around um, a very loving and supportive community. Whatever brings you joy, I invite you to share it with others sharing with like your family, you know, being able to embrace those experiences of joy and celebrating you, celebrating your identity and um, being really intentional in that process. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to say this quote, how do you heal shame by talking to our inner spirit? Oh, I can't wait. We're going to talk about that today too. Also, our inner child or wounded self about why shame doesn't serve us and speak to that self with a healing narrative that will train us to think and feel differently about ourselves. Absolutely. As we do that, we also teach our children and our children's children, our grandchildren, how to do those things as well. Whatever brings you joy, practice it daily. Be mindful when you experience it and always take time to reflect on it post it on social media, celebrate those pieces that gives you joy because that's that counteracting um, that's really important. And the message is around what does it mean to be strong? I hate that statement. So let's rethink strength in itself. Strength is about being able to accept that we need to bear our hearts and souls sometimes, and it's okay to do so. It's okay to be vulnerable, because that vulnerability strengthens us. Even if that person that we share that information to, even if they're not accepting or doesn't, or don't allow you to, or cut you down, you know, being able to share that part of yourself, that is the strength piece, not necessarily how they accept it. Being able to sit in failure and shame, it feels gross, it's yucky, it's painful, it's emotionally painful, but I'm ensuring you today that time will pass and um, that feeling will pass as well. And so teaching even your children how to do the same thing, because they're going to encounter those experiences of shame. And so you're contracting those experiences for them. We're all lifing. Lifing is lifing right now. And so just being able to ask for help as difficult as it could be, find your people, find your tribe ensuring that you know you have someone to go out to for support and you can also ask the same of strangers or people you don't know and what is very much for me is anti-blackness um and what i grew up in is there's a very lack of self-compassion and kindness you know my ancestors if you remember they had to work in fields for 
12, 15 hours a day. They were beaten. They were ill-fed. They were not people. And their humanity was really stripped away from them. And so the very nature that we sometimes don't give ourselves compassion is embedded in those early experiences. So give yourself back your humanity. Show yourself kindness and self-compassion. I'm moving along to relationships. And so we often, I don't think we've had enough, you know, chats in our workshops around emotions about relationships, sorry, and attachments. And I felt it was really important to have a conversation about that today. Um, attachment is that emotional bond that, you know, forms our connection with others. And there's different types of attachments. You know, the really ideal and purposeful attachment is secure attachment. But I'm sure many of us didn't grow up in environments where life was secure. So we have attachments that are anxious, that are resistant, that are avoidant and disorganized. And the word is just basically what it is. You know, anxious is feeling that it's hard to connect. Resistant is like, I'm avoiding connection. And disorganized is, I don't know if I should like you or not like you. I'm all over the place with my attachments. Those early attachments we learn, you know, really stems from birth and that connection with that early caregiver. But what we're learning, you know, through science, through brain development, is that attachments can be nurtured, it can be developed. And that initial connection with your caregiver doesn't determine how you will connect with other people. What's really important is that when you're developing or creating attachments with other people that you're quite intentional in terms of what you bring to that relationship. So how do you nurture secure attachments? Anyone have any suggestions? How do you nurture secure attachments? And I'm still giving you time. I'm just chatting about the next thing. Um, I think, you know, this, this term narcissistic or gaslighting, love bombing, you know, some of that popular language that we hear on social media and movies. But this is real when it comes to that attachment piece, right? And a strong attachment aspires connection, being able to connect with someone on a real level. It's reliability. You know, being able to have someone that you know is going to be consistent and be there for you and you do the same for that person, that is what um, builds a secure attachment. That secure attachment regulates your emotions um, and it happens with children too. So when your child is at 100 and they're anxious or they're crying, having a tantrum, and you're able to use that attachment connection to like bring down their emotion. That is a secure attachment. It also nurtures trust. So being able to know that um, you can go out and you can come back, but that person will be there for you. And the absence of these things can also lead to difficulties. So I gave examples like people who have, you know, disorganized, anxious attachments. They have a hard time trusting other people. They use love in a way that hurts. Um, it's almost like when people say it's manipulative, but it's really around um, they're trying to take care of themselves and survive. So they hurt you in the process. Um, the kind of the statement around hurt people hurt people. You also, you know, you don't attend to that person's attachment needs. Um, and I see this often, you know, with parents or they blame children, you know, you're the one who's the problem or you created this. So this is why I acted this way. Attachments are mapped, as I shared before, as patterns in our, vein, in our brain. So having a distrusting relationship with your caregiver. So if you knew that you grew up in an environment where there wasn't a secure attachment, you know that throughout your life, it's going to come back um, in very different ways. And so being really intentional around how you connect with people, it really helps you to create new patterns within your brain. And you can do that with your children. 
um, which is quite powerful. So people who have had insecure attachments like myself or anxious attachments or um, their parents just wasn't there, you can be able to build mature, secure attachments with your children. Um, I didn't see any examples in the chat, but I'll share some. So being able to look at your child in the eye, really important. Tell them that you love them. Even your grown 16 year old who like disrupts so much in your life sometimes, tell them that you love them. Connect with your heart, connect with your soul. If there is conflict or you're upset with them, be really intentional on resolving that conflict and creating an environment of forgiveness. You're teaching your child also how to be able to resolve conflicts in their life and in their attachments with others. Another fun, hopefully, exercise for everyone um, to share with us is what do you want to teach your child about love? And so if you can place your ideas in the chat and um, think about something that's positive, if that makes sense, like it's in a positive. So um, focusing on what do you want to bring into your child's life? So nothing that says don't or do, but something that brings positivity um, that will bring love into your child's life. And feel free to, to use a chat and I encourage my colleague Disha to also do the same as well. Tasia calling you out. What do you want to teach your child about love? Or anyone? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. That's biblical. Thank you. Love is a verb. Thank you. Love is kind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I inspire you all to live and be what you have shared with us today. Thank you. Probably the most difficult topic that I put together in our wellness discussion was around grief and loss. And feel free to thumbs up how many of you have experienced grief or loss. I have this like unique relationship because it started from birth. But I think as you get older, that relationship transforms in so many different ways. Um, when I grew up as a, a child of immigrant parents, so they're newcomers. Thank you. Um, they hold a lot of grief. And I learned this from my parents. So they grew up in their home in Trinidad and they had stories about grief that they told me. And sometimes I would just be like, are you like, did you just tell me this story? And like, weren't you traumatized? Like, this is, this is not okay. But for them, it was so much normalized. And part of their relationship with grief is that they learned that grief happens and we just move on. Um, but they also had that initial experience of immigrants where they couldn't engage or they can practice the same experiences around grief that maybe they were able to do so back home. Last week at our conference, you know, my esteemed co colleague, Dr. Kunda Kente, 
he delivered a keynote and he reminded us, you know, in the Caribbean, for example, and I know it happens in other places across the world, where we have this ceremony of nine nine. So when someone passes away, so they've passed away, um, there's a tradition called nine nights and you visit and you share stories of that person, you bring gifts and, and food. And it's, it's just like, it's almost like a celebration of that person in their life and that togetherness of family. Um, but that doesn't happen here. And when you live in a country where you're away from your family, you may not be able to participate in that same way. So people may pass away and you're never going, you're not going to their funeral or you're not part of those nine nights. And so that's that experience of unresolved grief. And we're not only talking about grief when someone passes away, there's other forms of sadness and grief that happens in our life. So grief of, you know, leaving your home from Trinidad to coming to Canada and experiencing racism. You know, when you came into this country, that is experience of grief. When you go into work and you experience violence in that workplace or micro or macro aggressions, um, when you battle loneliness, those are signs of grief and loss that people encounter. Um, growing up, my mom had people in her life that she had her best cousin that she used to play with and had a, you know, love so much. And then she said one day there was a house fire and her, her cousin's dad came and he took the child and moved to England and she never saw that cousin ever again. To me, that's like a huge example of grief. So people are just missing out of your life. You're missing those connections. Um, they just disappear and there's no closure. There's no way of understanding it. And you're always wondering like what happened to them? Um, COVID gives us grief. I saw a reel last night and um, in the reel, the gentleman had shared that, you know, COVID seemed to interrupt our life and our experiences. And there was a life before grief, before COVID. And then there's a life after. And that life has gone by so quickly. Um, and there's so much things that happen in such a condensed time. You know, and I wonder if we have, we would have had that same experiences if, you um, COVID never happened. Um, when COVID ended, I left without my best friend who passed away, my auntie, my cousin, um, my friend. I had to plan funerals. I sat beside people who were passing away. I ended friendships. Thank you so much for sharing. Changes with work. So many um, experiences of loss. So how do we... Um, how do we reconcile those experiences and how do we grieve in a way that we're also supporting our children to grieve in a healthy way? Because I don't want to teach my child or I wouldn't want to teach my nephews that grief is something that you just get over or you just move forward. How can we honor those experiences of grief and loss? <clears throat> so how does grief how does racism and oppression impact loss? And I go back to this experience um, around that connection of the impact of grief and loss connected to racism is that it stays into our hearts, stays in our minds and our bodies and our actions. It is really that type of pain that can impact every part of our experiences where racism creates inequities in all parts of our lives where we wish we're trying to achieve success, it takes that away from us. That grief then affects us physically, affects us emotionally, it affects us financially, it takes money out of our pockets. It impacts us spiritually and even transgenerationally. And the ways in which that we mourn, we don't always have those opportunities to do so. It's almost like we feel powerless in our grief. So immigrant families, they experience a tremendous amount of grief. And if you're coming from that space, you also understand and know that as well.
So here I explain, you know, what is grief, what is loss, and we've kind of really talked about that as well. So I don't want to sit in this area. Um, I also wanted to share this piece with you as well around the different types of grief that range from very complicated grief to um, collective grief. So we feel that grief together. Um, when it comes to things like end of a friendship, you know, if that doesn't end really well, that's almost like it's um, it can be a traumatic grief. It can be a disenfranchised grief, right? And all of those grief experiences kind of lays seeds into our minds, how we feel about ourselves, how we experience emotions um, in our life. And then we have grief inherited rules. So um, that experience of um, the loss of control, um, feeling that you're othered, feeling that you're devalued. And then it intersects with relationships. So imagine you're holding experiences of grief and you're starting a new relationship with someone, whether it's a friendship or an intimate relationship, your experiences of grief gets inter interwoven into that relationship and very much the, to that point around hurt people hurt people. You're anticipating that that friendship is going not going to go well. So you're not going to put the time in that friendship because the last time you did, your friend, you know, was rude to you or disconnected that relationship. Or you're not going to put your full heart into your, your new um, intimate partner relationship. Or you're very anxious about that new partner and that connection that you have together. And you're not sure if that person cares about you and you're interpreting every single thing that they do in a negative way that is connected to your past experiences that you've had in your in your past. And so being able to show up in relationships um, without that hurt or being able to manage that hurt is a skill, but it's important for you to be able to have lasting and loving relationships. So here's my next kind of open question for, for everyone. So how do you deal with grief? How do you heal grief? Sorry. How do you heal grief? What are your suggestions? And I invite my colleagues to also share their suggestions too. How do you heal grief? For me, as I shared before, teach your children about grief. So if someone has passed away or that friendship has changed over time, or you've had to change jobs or you've lost your job, helping your child understand, you know, that experience is part of life or um, helping them to verbalize how they feel about those experiences, et cetera, I can go on. But teaching your child how to navigate grief is really important. Um, when my aunt passed away, it was really important that her grandchildren were, you know, able to see the body and to um, be around her and to give her gifts um, because they also needed time to grieve and understand, you know, why grandma isn't able to get up. And so it's really important to find ways to be able to do so. And then you create that opportunity for your child to ask questions and to like explore whatever's going on for them. Teach your children how to deal with change. You know, many times children are so used to their routines that when changes happen, um, it's difficult for them to adjust. So what I used to do with my daughter and my foster children that I had was, you know, during the week, we'd have like a really routine schedule. On the weekend, I kind of like relaxed a lot, but it was intentional in the way that I wanted to teach them that it was okay that we did other things. And it's okay that, you know, at the beginning of the day, we decided what to do. And then we changed it halfway through. And that was okay. And whatever behaviors came out of that experience, we walked, we talked about it, we walked through it. 
but teaching them that change was okay. And then the other really important thing, you know, sometimes, well, when I grew up, I was told, you know, parents don't show their emotions, don't show their sadness. They may show anger, but they don't show sadness and they don't put that on their children. I'm not saying to put your emotions on your children, but I am encouraging you to be vulnerable with your children, to let them know it's okay that you grieve. It's okay that you feel hurt and it's okay that you're caring for yourself because what you're really doing is that you're modeling, you're modeling how you care for that holistic person. You're modeling um, what does it mean to um, care for yourself when you're struggling or when you're experiencing the, the feelings that come with grief. And my last but not final topic um, for you tonight. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate it. These are amazing ideas. Um, I will also share, I forgot to say that I will share the slides as well. So you'll have them for your reference. Um, and if you have any questions, do not hesitate to um, share them with me. And so my final kind of piece, you know, I started off talking about shame and then I talked about relationships. I talked about grief. And now I kind of wanted to end on trauma in hopes of providing some more tips and strategies in, in terms of how we can infuse that wellness um, in that experience for trauma. Until recently, we actually never really talked about intergenerational trauma. I think when I was growing up, my mom would talk about, um, you know, things would stay in families for seven years, or she, you know, shared that certain things would skip a generation, but we never really um, talked about what that impact is and what that looks like. And so um, it was really important for me to highlight the importance of an understanding intergenerational trauma. So I learned um, maybe 2020 that um, women form their eggs in utero. So my DNA was formed in my mom when she was growing in my grandmother. And so my ancestors and experiences that they had is very much as part of my DNA and who I am. And even if you hold um, a body or identity that's not black, you may um, hold different identities. Those ex experiences of trauma are also within you as well. Um, and the experience of racial trauma, so experiences that you have of stress related to racism, discrimination, those stressors, whether it's experienced individually or it's experienced as you're watching it on TV, um, those experiences impact and create um, experiences of trauma and can lead to stress um, within your everyday life. And so these are the symptoms that you'll see. Um, there's a lot. There's also um, other exp experiences in terms of how you feel, your thoughts, things that you think about yourself or how you think about other people. You may have catastrophic thinking. You may feel depressed. You may feel anxious. You may notice that you're using substances more. Um, but trauma does have an impact on our minds, our bodies, and our spirit and can impact and influence us in many different ways. How we respond to grief, how we respond to relationship difficulties, how we respond to shame also are connected with some of these symptoms. But I wanted to, to land here is that trauma in a people can look like culture. And so sometimes we are so used to some of the patterns that we've grown up in or the patterns of parenting that we've learned that we start to say that it's part of our culture. And a very clear example is spanking, right? Many of us grew up in an environment where um, it was okay to spank our children and we and we received spankings and you know we may have given our children spankings and that pattern of discipline or behavior is actually what came from enslavement. And when our ancestors did not behave, their enslavers would beat them. And that was a form of discipline. And so that 
pattern of behavior passed on generations, generations, almost to the point that we felt that that was a really good way of parenting because that was part of the culture. But sometimes our experiences, as I shared before, that is rooted in trauma. I wanted to share with you a short video um, about that. So give me a second. I'm going to stop sharing because I feel like it's not sharing properly. So let me see if I can try something. Thank you for sharing. I'm glad it hits deep maybe because I want it to in a way of empowering you as a parent. We have this vibratory sense, and we don't we don't have a language for it. I'm decontextualizing trauma, right? So trauma in a person looks like personality, can look like personality over time. Trauma in a family can look like family traits over time. Trauma in a people can look like culture over time. You know, what are some examples of culture? So my grandmother used to have a, a braided switch, right? that was braided and put behind uh, her, her and my grandfather's picture. And every time you look up, you see that switch, right? If we got out of line, right? My grandmother would would, uh, would whoop us, right? You know, get your butt back in line, whoop us. Well, think about 250 years of whippings, of rearing of, of brutality on the black body. I believe that whoopings is a traumatic retention from whipping. These are the things that we have to examine, right? And, and the same thing happens for white folks, right? White folks have never examined the thousand years of brutality that they experienced at the hands of other white folks through the Middle Ages, through through a thousand years of that, that Euro violence. And then that body came here, <laughs> right? Without any reprieve, without anything, and so, by the time elite white bodies offered poor white bodies whiteness, they, by the time they were offered the idea of not being servants, not being, um, and, and they were still were, but, but, but there was another level that was put in there, and that level was above uh, African. By the time they were offered it, they took it because they understood what the brutality was like at the hands of elite white bodies. They don't have a collective way of getting at that violence. Very short, but thoughts, considerations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hit me deep for sure. I'm confused. I'm like, I can't see my screen, but it was okay. You saw my screen. Sorry about that. It's like, what's happening? The saddest thing is that people don't realize or believe this is where it stems from in order to break the cycle. Yeah. Because I believe strongly that if we understand where things stem from, you know better, you do better, then you start to think differently. And so I agree 100%. As Black folk in the despair, we've been adopted many of these Eurocentric practices rooted in colonialism. Sorry. Absolutely. Right? And so you think about Eurocentric and whiteness and those ways of living, it devalues other ways of living. And so if you're able to identify what's happening, then you start to reverse that and say, hold on a second. There is no better or worse than. There is value in all of our identities. So how can we create space for that? And then culture masks a lot of trauma. Yeah. That was huge. People use it to hide behind 
as a security blanket, as a means of, for apathy. And um, I appreciate, I never heard it so eloquently before. Thank you. I will share the links as well. Those are like my heroes. So if I ever do talks, when I ever do talks, they're like always quoted. So I'm glad you appreciated them. So how do we heal trauma? And I could say many things, but I wanted to really ground it in the work of trauma-informed practice. So if you've experienced trauma, we've all experienced trauma. What we need, what's really important is safety um, and safety in relationships, which is why we talked about relationships before. Teach your children how to be safe. What does it mean for them to be safe within themselves, within their bodies? but also in their soul, because sometimes in our emotions, we need places that we feel safe. Be that safe place for your child. Um, and especially if your child is struggling, especially when they go through those teenage years and their hormones um, are out of where they need to be, they need you to be that safe space for them as much as they try to push you away. So be intentional in that. Cultivate safety for yourself, especially if you're, you know, for many years I worked in places I didn't love working in those places and I come home and I feel that pressure of being exposed to a lot of um, racial violence or just a lot of things, right? And so I had to figure out how do I cultivate safety for myself so that I'm not bringing onto my children or my foster children, you know, what I was going through wasn't being transferred onto them in a negative way. And so I had to find out what did I need to be safe? And I encourage and invite you to also do the same um, for yourself. That is wellness. It's also important that we understand how trauma works. We understand our triggers or how we emotionally respond to things. It's important for us to understand our boundaries and what we need to be able to reinforce safety. And when we're experiencing something or encountering something, that education is really important. I'll give you a, a very, I will give you a race related example. So for years I had, I have a really hard time driving and I see a police officer. I get really scared, really anxious and worried. And I try really hard to like pull over. And I think I didn't recognize it was happening. I think it was just happening and um, I wasn't paying attention to it. And so I started to really pay attention to how I was responding and that changed um, my outlook. So now when I'm in that space, I'm taking deep breaths or I'm listening to music. I'm finding ways to find safety because if that happens constantly and ongoing, then I'm always gonna be at this heightened state and that's not realistic. I need times for my body to have repeat as um, Resma and Ken Hardy will talk in their in their talks, it's important that my body has a reprieve that has an outlet from some of the trauma that we encounter or those heightened emotions. Um, and this is what I was very excited to talk about and recovery. So um, it was shared so beautifully before the importance of that inner child and engaging in parts work. So I mentioned before, you know, I get really nervous around police, obviously it's past experiences, but if I go all the way back, which I did, it really started from watching my dad have interactions with the police. That was very scary. And so that part of myself gets reignited or remembers those feelings. And our brain is intelligent and brilliant and networked, but it's also very patterned. So it doesn't know the difference between anxiety that I felt 40 years ago and anxiety that I'm feeling today. And so I have to walk myself through that. We all have to walk ourselves through that. So this very complex topic of you know inner child work. If you're noticing or you're feeling triggered or that emotional response is coming up, it's important to tap into that inner child. And for me, and, and what I encourage my clients to do, what I encourage you to do, and even for your, your littles that you work with, is reassurance and validation. You know, many times my clients will say, I just don't want to feel it, I don't want to hear it, but I am inviting you to pay attention 
and listen, create space to listen to that inner part of you that's trying to tell you something, that they're scared or that they're worried or that um, they think something bad's going to happen or they're not good enough or worthy. All the things that were placed or kind of seeds that were planted with you as you were growing up. So create space to listen to that inner person and address the hurt. Um, being able to say to yourself, I hear you. I remember that was really scary too, but I'm reassuring you that you're safe now. And what is different from the inner child at seven is that that seven-year-old did not have the resources to support, to understand, to access guidance. That seven-year-old didn't know what to do, but that 40-something-year-old does. And so reassuring yourself that I will have the resources that I need to be able to take care of myself. So speaking to that inner child is really important. The next um, important part of what I'm sharing to you and as we close for today is um, talking about healing and healing in different ways. Um, so just checking out the child really quickly. So um, Resma's book is really good. Absolutely. I think he wrote a new book too that I will capture and get. Um, but yeah, he's a really good author. Um, when you're triggered with your emotions, you know, being open to talk about those emotions are really important. Um, and being able to feel it, be able to be in the moment because I know emotions feel hard, but they don't actually, um, they need to be out. They need to be reprieved as, as Resma would say, right? They, we need that reprieve from the emotions that we encounter. So when it comes to healing, um, any approaches are important, but I really value the Afrocentric approach. I grew up um, in that approach and the belief that we are all connected as people, that our spirituality and our soul are connected as well, and um, the importance of um, community and gathering um, are very much part of that Afrocentric approach. And so when you're thinking of healing, it's not just the Eurocentric ways of going to therapy or um, going to the gym, think of it more as that holistic being and that holistic person. What's really important is finding ways to move your body. Movement helps to release trauma in many different ways. And it doesn't have to be just through exercise. It can also be through your breath, just being able to breathe. It happens to dance. It happens in massage. Um, when I fostered, you know, what was really important for me was to reinforce the importance of good touch with children. And so, especially teenagers and older, so we would ensure that they had opportunities to get massages. And that was an example of a way of like relieving their tension, re relieving some of the, the difficulties that's stuck in their body and trying to get that out. And so even if you are able to do things like massage therapy, um, if you're able to do swimming or if you're able to just listen to music and dance, you can do so in an intentional way that is helping you to release um, those experiences of trauma that you've had in your body. As I shared with you before, um, building safe spaces is important for your healing. Um, being active and intentional, this is a journey. And checking in with yourself. Sometimes as a parent, we don't often check in with ourselves. We're so busy like going and doing so many things. So whatever time of the day that you're able to do it, whether you're 
in the shower or you're just about to close your eyes, check in with yourself. Um, how are you feeling? How's your posture? Are you relaxed? Have you breathed for the day? Like intentionally breathing. Is there a thought that's resonating with you that started and has been going on all day? My mind does that a lot. I think a lot. And so sometimes I need to just, what what's going on in my head right now? And these are activities that you can do without doing too much, really. And it doesn't take up too much time either. Creating balance is important. Um, ensuring that in life, we're going to go through ups and downs. But if you know that you're going to hit a rough patch, and a very simple example is winter is not my thing, then figuring out how you can infuse wellness to create a ba better balance for yourself is really important and being really proactive in that. Um, it also is teaching you to um, be proactive with your children. And so that leads to the next point around that self-care plan um, that is important for you. Um, what else did I wanted to share with you? Talked about this before. Um, ugh. I love resilience, but I also feel that not everything needs to be resilient from or not everything that we need to grow from. But um, adopting some traits or encouraging others in your life to adopt certain traits can help build your resilience. So being open to new challenges, it's hard, but it's important. Um, doing something that you're committed to being able to do. So if you're trying something new, stay committed to that. That helps to build your resiliency. Um, developing goals for yourself, no matter what they are, personal goals, but also relational goals, so goals with like friends or families or intimate partners. Um, and also showing yourself empathy and compassion, like passing that on to other people is really important. Um, I think I'm gonna do one more video with you as we wrap up today. I totally forgot to, to cue it, but um, this video is from the late Thich Nhat Hanh, and he talks about the importance of being able to listen to others and being able to be present when they are struggling, when you're struggling, or even if your child is struggling. So I wanted to share this with you because I think it's a good way to kind of end off our evening that we've had together. Um, and if you have any questions or thoughts, um, please, you know, feel free to share um, that with us as well. Let's see if I remember how to. You refer to, I can't remember which book, but you talk about deep listening also. Deep listening is the kind of listening that can help uh, relieve the suffering of the other person. Uh, you can call it uh, compassionate listening. You listen with only one purpose, help him or her to empty his heart. And if you remember that uh, you are helping him or her to suffer less, and then even if he say things full of uh, wrong perceptions, full of bitterness, you are still capable to continue to listen with compassion because you know that listening like that with compassion, you give him or her a chance to suffer less. If you want to help him or her to correct his perception, and then you wait for another time, but for this, the time being, you just listen with compassion and help him or her to, to suffer less. And one hour like that can bring transformation and healing. So I love this idea of deep listening because oftentimes when someone comes to you and they want to 
really vent. They want to purge whatever is going on inside them. People start talking and giving advice. So if you allow the person just to let whatever those feelings are to come out, and then at another time, come back to them with your advice or your comments, you would you would experience a, a, a deeper healing. That's what you're saying. Yes. Uh, the fear, the anger, and the despair is born on the ground of wrong perception. And we have wrong perceptions concerning ourselves and the other person. And that is the foundation for conflict in war and violence. You've said that the only way we can begin to end war is be, is, is due to communication between people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should be able to say like this, dear friends, dear people, I know that you suffer a lot. I have not understood enough of your difficulties and suffering. It's not our intention to make you suffer more. It is the opposite. So please tell us about your suffering, your difficulties. I'm eager to learn to understand. It has to start like that, loving speech. And if we are honest, if we are true, they will open their heart and tell us. And then we practice compassionate, deep listening. And during the process of deep listening, we can learn so much about our own perception and their perception. Mm -hmm. And that is the best way, the only way to remove a terrorism. Terrorism or even difficulties between your, yourself and yes. family members or friends. Yes. And the principle is the same no matter the conflict. Yes. Terrorists, anti-terrorists, yes. father and son. Right. Yourself and your boss. Right. Yourself and your children, your best friend. Yes. Let me see if I can try to share the last piece, but um, any questions? Thank you. Thanks for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. I appreciate that you came, that you listened. I will share the... Um, I will share the slides with you. Sorry, I forgot. Slides, the links, um, any information that you need. And then I also shared in the chat that if you um, also have a topic or know a presenter who'd like to present, um, please do not hesitate to connect with us. Um, and thank you for, for staying with me this evening. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tisha, as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for conducting such a beautiful and insightful presentation. I mean, uh, I don't have very much to say because as I asked the question about triggering emotions, so I don't know, uh, it wasn't something that was related to me or something, but I don't know, I'm feeling so heavy at the moment and uh, um, I don't know. But uh, I just have to control my emotions and I don't know, but I'm just getting triggered. Like Maybe I'm just wanting or looking for someone to whom I can just uh, splurge out whatever is going on in my head. And yeah, but apart from that, this presentation was surely helpful, like um, since I'm single for the moment. And uh, whenever I'm going to be a parent, I'll just try my all best that I, I am not um, passing on the intergenerational trauma or like the patterns that I, the faulty patterns, I would say that I have learned from my parents or from my ancestors. Um, and that is why I always try to just heal whatever I'm feeling and whatever are my triggers. And I just uh, write it down whenever I uh, realize that, oh, this is one of my triggers as well. So, yeah. And I thank you. you sharing. Oh, my gosh. I appreciate you sharing. You shared a lot of gems, too. I think um, it's important to write. It's important to journal. It's important to understand or process yourself. 
but it's also important to um, release it too, right? So if you find that you haven't moved in a while, or um, I said to my sister this afternoon, because she doesn't know songs, I'm like, you don't listen to music because music just being able to like get out the emotion that you're feeling. So finding ways of like physical repeat is really important. And then sometimes it's also about grounding. So if I'm nervous about something or something's on my mind, I could just do, um, I could sage, I can put on a candle, which I think I did this afternoon. Um, but finding ways to like bring your body temperatures and um, some of that anxiety down is really important because then you can show up better, right? Um, for other people and for yourself as well. So I appreciate you sharing that. And yeah, and winter can be hard, especially for for us who are so used to the sun and so used to like um, being in warm spaces. And so being really intentional about, you know, how am I going to take care of myself during this time of the year um, is really important. So thank you for sharing you have a community um and reaching out to your community is also important thank you oh thank you so much thank you also for sharing your thoughts and you and your experiences it also helped to enrich our conversation today so thank you so much everyone and um as i said do not hesitate to reach out our email um, will be sh shared with you, but it's info at kajungafamily.org. And um, I'll also share the slides with you after the presentation. So thank you again. Thanks, Tisha. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.